All right, it's my, my privilege to announce our next speakers, Amelia Wilson and Brett Dillingham of Huna Heritage Foundation. Please give them a warm welcome and your kind attention. Waiwa. Good afternoon. It's so wonderful to see all of your faces and to be here learning all that we're learning. We're happy to share a little bit of the work that we're doing. My English name is Amelia Wilson, and I am the executive director of Huna Heritage Foundation. My name is Brett Dillingham. I'm the digital archivist for Huna Heritage Foundation and help tell stories with them. Uh, before we go any further, can I get a show of hands of any active duty military or veterans? I'd like to thank you for your service. If we could give them a round of applause, please. At Huna Heritage Foundation, we do uh, several things, and one of those is providing scholarships for higher education for shareholders and descendants. We also provide our way of life, community programming and events, and we have a library and archives. Out of the call from our shareholders, we uh, about two years ago started a digital archives, and you can see up on the screen, um, this uh, began with actually the former executive director, Sarah Dibdahl, and it was through a grant through the Institute of Museum and Library Services. And we've been talking a lot about the history um, of, of our cultures and a lot about language, a lot about documentation. And so it's really a pleasure to be able to share some of the work we've been doing to make sure that we're documenting and providing access to some of those treasures that we've uh, had people documenting throughout our history of Huna. I wanted to share with you why we're here today <clears throat> and why our, our work with Huna veterans fits the conference theme of indigenous perspectives on climate change. Our work isn't with physical climate change, like global warming. It's the climate of understanding and accepting and honoring veterans who have served our country. And we're going to show you what we've learned about this climate of warming hearts and how we've begun to share the stories of the veterans from the Army and Navy Air Force, Marines, Coast Guard. And I've had the honor and pleasure of interviewing these veterans and publishing their stories on the Huna Heritage uh, Archival website. And we'll show you what this looks like. And then we're going to show you how we do this. But first, I'll show you a handful of some of these interviews and the information that these veterans have shared so that their families, their community, and coming generations know what they did, what they went through, and how they feel about it. All right. So first, I just want to give you a very brief look at the website. This is what it is when you go to archives.hunaheritage.org and then we always have some featured content one of them here is one of the veterans from Huna Stanley Steamy Thompson another is the master weaver Annie Lawrence another is the Huna double ender boats you can also browse by category, arts and artists, events and gatherings, fishing, government, 
the Huna Fire of 1944, logging, military and veterans, and people and places. This is a interview with Steenly, Steamy Thompson, who's been kind enough to donate some land in Huna, where we will be assisting and, and helping to coordinate a totem pole that honors the veterans of Huna. Steamy. <laughs> grew up there. And I'm hoping to get a little really volume uh, here. It's really chop suey. Uh, yeah, I'm gonna, this, but, uh, I want to start it from the very beginning because it's just nice to hear. Stan Thompson, known in Huna and Steamy. <laughs> grew up there. Boy, it's really a uh, chop suey. Uh, business, but uh, English, Irish, uh, Norwegian, and uh, Clinkett, uh, the Army, U.S. Army. I was a specialist for class, I guess. I'm not sure what they really call that. I volunteered for the draft. Uh, during school, I had, uh, uh, you know, waiver uh, to go in the service, and uh, when I got out, uh, I uh, went to work for Boeing's, I guess, uh, for a little bit, about a year, I think, and then I I uh, volunteered for the draft. I wanted to, uh, really, really, no, I haven't thought of it for many years. I uh, was, I think, sometime in the uh, early fall. Uh, 1954, I think. Yeah. The next one I want to listen to a little bit is Ozzy Shakley. And this photograph here, he's accepting the medallion that was given in honor of the Clinkett Code Talkers. Uh, it was presented by Lisa Murkowski and Mark Begich, and he brought it back from Washington, D.C. Um, together, you easy only time to come together to get together. I went to Huna. Victor Bean was already sick. So we told him we decided we're going to give that medal to Victor Bean, his dad's, in public. Adam Green was still alive, World War II veteran. So we told Adam that since he was in World War II too. We wanted him to present it to Victor for us. He said he knew, knew he was a code talk. And we had all the veterans march in with Rich, uh, uh, Adam. It looked pretty, pretty a good show. That's all I tell him to. Everybody's watching us. Make sure we look good. And they always do that. Uh -huh. So we did the same thing in the A&B Hall. The show. We had a pretty good turnout down there when they came to see the gold code talker medal. But uh, something that I didn't get too much information on is when I went to pick it up. I got calls from LA Times, a uh, New York newspaper, biggest newspapers in the country, to interview me on the medal. And when they handed me the medal, there was about a hundred cameras out there, flashing like crazy up there, who were holding the medal. Had national coverage on it. Bill Thomas came down. This next audio, well, it was up there. I'll have to. I'll have to pop it. There we go. Is uh, James Lindoff? My name is James Lindoff Jr. Hey, I'm a veteran from Huna, Alaska. I was in the 101st Airborne Division. I'm a sergeant when I left. I got my draft notice. I was going to go to the Navy, but I sobered up, honest. And when I got to Anchorage, I went to the induction there and volunteer draft. 1966, living in Huna, graduated that year. I was going to be in the Navy, but I said four years, a little too much for me. I want to get back and go fishing when I come back from the server. I never thought nothing about Vietnam or the Army of two years and go we'll see what's going on. There was 19 of us too. I'm 19. 19 from Juneau and 
two from Huna and one from Rangoon. We landed in Seattle to pick us up in the bus, took us to Fort Lewis, Washington. Next morning, we had the drill sergeant, Stewart, a little, a little smaller than us, a little buck sergeant, and he told he was going to be our drill sergeant. And he had us line up and get ready to march. And he told us left face, and everybody was, that didn't make that left face got a rock in their left hand. Your military left. That's what, I don't think nobody will forget that part when they first get in the army. And they, you have their first marching, and you don't make that left face. And you get a left, you get a rock in your left hand, and you remember left face. That was first day. This next gentleman is Dwayne White. Um, you might know him as Officer White now if you see him in, in town because he's uh, he's now a Juno policeman. Um, and this is kind of how he how he got to be a Juno policeman, how he figured out the route that he wanted to take. Through a few years of college, that college wasn't really working out for me, and I wasn't really enjoying it that much. I remember one day driving, uh, I think we were on the city bus in Anchorage, and I seen this uh, Anchorage police officer drive by. And I remember this, this, this uh, and I remember this is exactly how it went. As we were on the bus, I was driving, we were on the bus, and I see the Anchorage APD drive by, and I'm telling my girlfriend at the time, it's Amber, my wife now. I remember telling her, it's like God, that that would be an that would be an awesome job to be a police officer. I've always wanted it to be. I just never thought it was going to be. It was never going to happen for me. I guess it was just a, a uh, something that just wasn't for me. Oh, couldn't be done. I guess it was impossible for me to do. I don't know why I thought that. I kind of just thought, you know, that's something you like to do as kids, and something really never you're going to do as an adult. And so I just, I just said, I just said um, that'd be an awesome job. And my wife, she said, uh, well, why don't you do it? And it just it never came to me. It was like, well, why don't, why don't I try? Or what can I do to go towards that being a police officer? And I thought about it, and I was like, you know, I started thinking, I was like, well, I actually can do that, you know? So I started thinking, well, what can I do to pursue that job as law enforcement, as a police officer? And the conclusion that came to my mind was you get some type of some experience and also the Army also could pay off my student loan debt, so I could do these two things from branch of service. The only branch that I ever thought of growing up as a kid, or you thought think, you think about people in the service, you think about the Army. Nothing else really stood in mind, the Marines, the Navy, the Air Force. So when I started thinking about... And then the last bit that uh, I'd like you to hear is um, from Chris Hussman, who is in the uh, National Guard for eight years. And I'm like, no, I'm doing it. You know, I'm not. I said, I'm joining the Army National Guard. It's just the one weekend a month. I said, I, I need to do this. And so I did. And then when I came back, and I think, you know, it changed my mom's view of I hear her talking to people like, oh, my daughter was, you know, in the Guard. And, you know, I'm proud of her. And <clears throat> my stepdad actually, he called me Sarge. Before he passed away, he'd tell the nurses, he's like, oh, my, my daughter, yeah, she was in the, you know, she was in the Army. She was, she's my sergeant because, you know, she can lift me. You know, I would lift him up from, you know, because he couldn't walk. So he's like, always go get sergeant. <laughs> and he was in the military, too. So, and so he always... He always called me his sergeant, and he was proud of me, and that's... I never had a dad growing up, and so he was more of a dad to me, and so, um, and so I, you know, I made him proud. You know, I made my kids proud, and that's all that counts. Um, before I go any further with this, I also want to acknowledge that <clears throat> Mr. Sergius Shakely, who's sitting over here, I've just recently got his interview up as well. Um, I was able to show it to him on my laptop just a half hour ago or something, so he can hear it as well, and he showed his sister, Mary Lou. Um, I also wanted to acknowledge Mr. Daryl Brown uh, sitting uh, back there. Would you be kind enough to stand up for a moment, Daryl? Thank you very much. Let's give him a hand. He's on the Huna Veterans Committee that helps make this happen. <laughs> did I say on it or did I say the chairperson? I, I can't remember. Something like that. Um, but... Uh, yeah, so this is the kind of work that we've, uh, we've been doing. And, and in order to make this happen, we had to create a, a process. And 
I think that that comes from identifying the needs. <laughs> so it was just important for us to be able to show you, and I think we've been talking a lot at this conference about the importance of documentation um, in our communities and um, our, our culture and our history. And in Huna, we're very proud of our veterans, um, those men and women who have served and sacrificed, and the families that supported them through that service, because as our uh, committee has guided us, uh, that it's it was the whole family that really was part of this experience. And um, much to our surprise, a lot of family members didn't really know about the service of, of their family members. And as we started collecting photos, we had some family members saying, I didn't know my uncle was a paratrooper. And we just thought, well, that's just um, gives us more reason, more affirmation for why this is really important to document so that we have these stories for later. And uh, we started this project with collecting photographs. And as I was putting up photographs for the digital archives of Huna history, I realized that we didn't have very many photos of our veterans. But we were a community that really celebrated and um, were really proud of those men and women. And so why didn't we have these photos? I wasn't sure. So I started reaching out to veterans and asking them. I started with my father. And, uh, and we put it up here on, onto our site and started collecting information about them. And I wasn't quite sure if this was OK. And I wanted to tread lightly. And one day, I had a, a veteran after I asked for his photo and was explaining what we're doing. And I, I kind of showed him some examples of, of some photos that we had up. And he turned away from me. And I thought, oh, no, maybe I offended him. And he turned back and he said, we've been waiting for this for a long time. And I thought, oh. Thank goodness. OK. <laughs> and so I was just it really um, made me happy that I could make sure that we're capturing. And we wanted to make sure we're capturing their words, their story, that it wasn't our accounting of, of what they have done. And so by starting with those photos, we realized that we needed um, more. We needed to, to be able to really not just have the photographs and what would be better than to have their own words and what their own account was of their time in service. And so that's what started this uh, Huna Veterans History Project. So how to make this happen? You know, how, how do we get this started? And we had to get a committee of Huna veterans together. And everybody that we asked agreed to be on it. I think we started with Ozzy. Was he the first one that you uh, asked to be? I think it was James. OK, James Lindoff and Huna, um, who you heard. And, and also, uh, Ozzy is the, the commander, I believe, of the Southeast Alaska Native Veterans. And he was gung-ho to do it. So we put together a committee because we wanted to do this right. We wanted to show them how much we value their time. And so the invites went out, and the acceptances happened. And they helped us gather all these different various lists of veterans in Southeast and of Huna, and we put them all together into one big list. And from that list, we put as much information as we could get on, just on the list so we could start contacting people. Of course, most of them are deceased because this list goes back to the, the Alaska Territorial Guard, World War II, Korean War, et cetera. And so the committee guided us into trying our best to first interview the eldest because no one knows how long they'll be around. And so we've done that as much as we can. Sometimes it's just convenient if someone, if a veteran is coming from Huna to Juneau to visit or for medical, for travel, then we go ahead and interview them in the office. We also will be interviewing in Huna less than a month from now. We have about a dozen people set up for interviews there. We're planning on doing 50 altogether. That's what our grant calls for. Maybe we'll do more. But that's what our, our, our target is. We also made it a point to uh, make sure we got as many female veterans as we could, of which there's quite a few. 
We provide an honorarium to thank them for their time and taking their lives out to give to us and to give to future generations. We've, we found that face-to-face -face interviews, that's what we want, but we've done them on the telephone, and that's worked as well. We also have release forms so that we can keep this and honor the veterans, and, and they can decide whether or not the interview they gave is what they want to be on there. And usually what happens is after an interview, I ask them, is there anything you said that you wouldn't want published? And nobody has said, no, there's nothing on, there's something on there. I don't want that on there. They've always said, no, the whole thing. We've revised our standard release form with guidance from the HUNA Veterans Committee. And we've included a form from the Library of Congress, Veterans History Project, that includes relevant information so we've got everything that we can for future generations. Things such as what medals they earned, what their dates of service was, their highest rank, et cetera. And we've learned some lessons through it. Um, one thing, thankfully, we already knew what to do is have coffee ready, good coffee or water when someone walks in. Um, I try to research the branch of service as much as I can first, the historical time period where they may be deployed or stationed. And then when, when they walk in, it's just nice and relaxed first, coffee, drinking, talking. We also use equipment to do this, because if you were going to do something of, of this nature, and we're happy to talk with you about everything we've done, and we have handouts that, we'll, that I'll give out in just a, a couple minutes that give a lot of the information I'm talking about right now. But we use a, a fairly high-end audio recorder, okay? It's called a Zoom H6. But you can, if you're on a budget and you want to do interviews, you can use a smartphone, or you can buy an external speaker to go with, or microphone to go with a, a smartphone that's a little higher end. You can actually spend up to $5,000 on a speaker for one of these. I don't recommend it, but if you want to. There's a software called Audacity, which is free, which is an editing software. And there's multiple YouTube sites which show you how to use that software. That's also on the handout. Um, I think that's enough of the process. We also wanted to share um, about the the program that we use here um, because I think that it it makes it really um, it's user friendly and it's a bit like a template the whole website and so in the work that you're all doing to pr to make sure that you're documenting and providing access to. Um, the important work of uh, language and culture and providing access to that we wanted to share this uh, program that we use, um, and, and Brett showed you the first page. Um, it's, it's just a really great site, and it's very easy to put together. There are a number of examples. I'd, I'd like to pull one up um, quickly here um, for language. And so this is a little off of the veterans work, but again, be, to tie it back to some of the work that's been done um, by the communities here and the interest of language documentation, um, I believe Elfie was talking about the need to be able to hear um, the language. And so sometimes it's not enough to be able to read it, but you need that pronunciation. And so there are some examples, and Brett's passing out a handout. <clears throat> but this is an example. Um, from the Plateau People's Web Portal, and it's from the Coeur d'Alene Language Program. And so they've taken... I'm not sure about the audio. Hi. <laughs> So they, this is just one example. Um, I don't have time to, to pull up, but I did provide some addresses. There's some really neat things going on with this, um, this program. And the program is uh, free and open source. And so it's kind of, I don't know if anyone has heard of Wix, 
but it's like a website, kind of like a template program. And so basically this, this software, this program is uh, called Mukudu, and it's free open source. And so there's so many different options and it's designed for indigenous communities to be able to share uh, things that they're working on. And there's different privacy settings that you can have. You can include audio, you can include photos, um, you can include um, writing, and so for the purposes of any um, language uh, projects, this would be um, a site that we would recommend. And so there are a number of, um, on the handout, the Pokogan Band of Potawatomi is using it for language features, the Coeur d'Alene Language Program, um, the Catawba Indian Nation, they're all using this Mukudu uh, software uh, to be able to share their language. Uh, and in Alaska, not yet up on published websites, Barrow is also using it to document, and they've got a really great project that they're doing where they have old tapes that they have um, digitized, and they're putting down the transcribed um, in, in Inupiaq, and then the English translation, and then you get to hear the audio. And so there's just really some endless possibilities. Uh, Yukon Kayakuk School District um, has got Susan Pascavan working on uh, some Athabascan language resources, and the Alutic Museum has done some work. So just to provide you um, with some examples. And again, <clears throat> this is just one of the things that we're trying to do uh, at Huna Heritage Foundation, but making sure that we um, are honoring our, our veterans and their service and that we're documenting it and providing a resource for current and future generations to be able to access uh, their, their family, relatives, And we're also doing a um, short film series. We just had a, a short film completed that was 20 minutes in length. Uh, we're planning on doing six of them. The first one we had done was on the Huna Fire of 1944, and we just celebrated or uh, commemorated uh, the 75th anniversary. And so it was important to make sure that we're taking those things from our archives and using them to uh, create something that people could access because we don't preserve for preservation's sake. I, I like to think of our foods that we put up and all the work that goes into it. If you're going out to get a fish, uh, you have to get the fish, you have to gut it, you have to process it, and then preserving it is a lot of time and effort. And if you let that go to waste, it's such a shame, right? So. All of these people who came before us and they had preserved our history and our stories, um, it's important for us as this current generation to, to not let that go to waste, that we're honoring that, that they had thought um, enough of, of us as the, the future generation to make sure that they're preserving our history and our culture. And so it's an honor to be able to work on these projects and to try to make sure that we're making use and providing access to that history that was documented and making sure that we're doing our part to document now, document these veterans, because when we're gone, we'll leave that legacy of, of the sacrifice of these men and women. Thank you very much. And we'd be happy to take some questions. Marilyn? Hi, Amelia. Um, I was just curious if there's... I was just curious if there's a way to convert this into a, um, either a booklet or pamphlet so you have you know, something that you could distribute to people? Is, have you looked into? In particular, do you mean like the veterans history? Yeah. The um, I think that's a great idea. I, um, for us, we wanted to start with the digital archives because yeah. it, was, it was what we were capable of doing and mm -hmm. it provided the most access. Um, and um, actually, Huna Heritage is, um, there's two of us. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, and we also do, like I said, the scholarships and the cultural programming. So we're looking at expanding. And, and I think you're right. It's important. We're, we're going to be working on a new project to document our clan lineage. Um, we just got a, a grant award for that. And 
Uh, and so we're planning on doing several hundred print booklets as well as putting it online. Mm -hmm. um, but um, right now we've not gotten uh, that far. But we're we're documenting right yeah. now and and getting it up. So well, that's what a what a great project you're working on. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Sergeant Shakley, um, I grew up in Huna. Um, I'd like to see also the history of the uh, the Huna fishing fleet out of uh, Huna. Um, we had a lot of great captains that uh, have passed on. They were, I think, one of the uh, elite, if not the best, uh, fishing fleet and fishing captains that we had. The um, fished out at the uh, Indian Islands, and no one, uh, no one else in the country or the United States or whatever knew how to fish out the Indian Islands because of the strong tides there. And uh, I'd like to see uh, uh, some history of that, documentation of uh, these, um, even a fishing memorial of the uh, boats that were uh, came out of Huna and the uh, captains that fished out at the Indian Islands. Um, I've been pushing that for years now, and um, I've yet to see any kind of uh, um, program that'll um, that'll commemorate these captains and these fishing boats that came out of Puna. Uh, I was very proud to know and fish out at the Indian Islands and know some of these uh, captains. In fact, one of the captains is here now, uh, Kenny Grant, uh, he fished out there. So, but there, that's just a very few of them that knew how to fish out there. All the, all the people that knew how to fish out there, all the captains, they all have passed on. So I'd like to see more information about that. Thank you. Thank you, Curtis. That's definitely something that's on the list. And um, we're, before this project, there was, there was nowhere you could go for any photos or history um, that was collective for Huna. And so that's definitely something. And you're right, Huna is known as the home of the million dollar fleet. Currently, we have photos. And here's, here's the fleet that Sergius is speaking of. And that's one of the topics that we'd like to do a, a sh short film on. Um, and I, I agree, Sergius, it's very important. There's, there's so much of our histories, especially in our smaller communities. We can't wait for large institutions or organizations um, we can do it. Um, it's, it's right now Brett and I, and, um, and we're, we're doing what we can on this project. But I think if, if we can do it, actually, um, next month we're going to accept an international award. Um, it's the 2019 International Guardians of Culture and Lifeways Archives Institutional Excellence Award. And uh, this is, thank you. <laughs> And this is because of the work that we've been doing. And so this is, if, if an organization with, with two of us doing this archival work in digital archives um, can get recognized on this international level, any one of our organizations and communities can be pulling together our, our history um, and providing photos and videos and interviews and documentation. My English name is Linda Wynn. My Tlingit name is Kanatine. 
being a former records manager from C. Alaska Corporation and a master's degree in library information science, I want to commend the Huna Totem for such a wonderful project of capturing your own history. This is what SHI or Rosita has been saying, that each one of us is responsible to capture our own history, not just SHI, not C. Alaska Corporation, but you are the experts. You're the ones that possess the knowledge. It is a matter of sharing it. And I, I'm just really impressed. I share with Brent that another suggestion when you're interviewing um, the vets, even if the ones have passed on and you know who the descendants are, you can get a bronze coin from the U.S. Mint of the Klinka Code Talker in bronze for $6.95. How wonderful would it be is to give one of those coins to the vet or the member of the family as a remembrance? Because this is so important. My own brother um, served at the Gulf War. Um, I have a nephew that was in Afghanistan as a Marine. Um, there are other grand um, veterans. I, my whole family, my uncles, you know. I even have um, family members here like um, uh, well, Paul Marx. I believe he was in the Army. Um, there's just so many, including women too as well. So good to cheese, Amelia, and your team. Continue your hard work and seek out among the youth to help with your digitization. I have worked with um, Clinton and Hyda Youth Program, um, training them in records management. Granted, it was boring for them, but th it's important work on gathering information. So you almost have to be crazy about gathering and researching uh, for this information, but it's actually quite fun. So, gonna cheesh. Thank you, Linda. I appreciate those comments. Um, we actually have had um, student interns from the high school that have helped, and, and we do have the 1964 yearbook um, online because they digitized that, and um, a Huna history book written in 1973, which is our only published history book on Huna, um, and those are both uh, possessions of the, of the owned by the school. And so in partnership with the school, we had students come in to learn the digitization process, and um, including uh, creating a spreadsheet with all the metadata. And, um, and so we, we also have that um, online as well. And I agree that we need to be telling our own histories. We don't want somebody coming in and trying to tell the history for us, because they're not going to do it as well, which is why we wanted to make sure that our veterans' history is told by our veterans. Thank you for your comments. Thank you, Gunnar This is going to be short and sweet. It's a terrific subject. I think maybe it's about the third or fourth uh, military short that Huna has done, and each time they have made an impact. Um, what I appreciate about this um, particular one is the um, handout asking the listener's opinion. And it, it's, it's a good idea. That's when you get participation from the audience. Thank you. Thank you, Marie. I just had one question. Um, if we want to add any new vets that are not on the list, who do we talk to? Um, great question. Thank you. And that's why we created the handout. And we've got my contact information, my email, my phone number, and Brett's email and phone number. Um, we're the only two at Huna Heritage at this time. And um, Brett is the lead on the Veteran History Project. We were hoping, actually, that somebody would say, hey, we've got a Huna veteran that we um, have in mind. And so we would, we would love to hear from you. <clears throat> Thank you. 
I'm a, uh, work for Alaska Native Voices, and I tell the story about Glacier Bay, about what happened with the Huna people. And um, I would really like to see that story put in print or with the elders telling the story. And uh, I, I uh, share the story with the kids here in Juneau uh, in the school system because it was like a climate change time that we went through with uh, with the uh, small uh, you know um, ice age that we had 250 years ago. But when I think about Huna and see all the great things that happened there with like the veterans, with uh, some of our students have really excelled like you, you know. I mean, we have young leadership that we're really proud of and I really believe that the resilience that we went through 250 years ago has a lot to do with that. And I would like to see something like that, like a video or, or something. Goodness, sheesh. Thanks, Leona. Serge is shaking again. Um, I forgot to mention one thing. Um, the Ice Straits Cannery, that's uh, now the Ice Straits Point, um, which is being used for um, tourists. Um, back behind the cannery, there used to be uh, small huts on, on the back of the uh, cannery there. And what I didn't mention was a lot of the uh, the uh, Huna women worked at that at cannery, and uh, I would like to also mention that uh, those women um, should be also mentioned, uh, even given memorial for for the work they did behind there, because working in canneries was not easy. It was a hard labor job, and they did not get the best wages, but they worked hard. And uh, I'd like to just mention that part of it. Thank you. Thank you, Sergis. Well, I thank you for your time and um, your interest. And I appreciate the opportunity to be able to share. It's been so heartwarming and uplifting. Uh, listening to all the different speakers and presenters and learning what great things are going on in our region and uh, how wonderful it is to be able to come together and celebrate all of these successes. Thank you and enjoy the rest of your time at the conference.